Hi everyone, it's James Griffiths. Welcome back to the channel and a second instalment of my look at albums that were always destined to be overshadowed by their illustrious predecessor. I hadn't intended to make this a two-part video, but after I made the video, I realised there were some records that I would wanted to talk about. I thought of editing in a section, but I thought that will make part one too long, so let's just go for a part two. So the concept is albums that were released um, in the wake of a particular particularly spectacular, illustrious, well-regarded album by a particular artist. So it didn't really matter what that next album was going to be like, it was always going to be overshadowed. So um, let's go through the little pile I've got here and we'll start with this one which is the one really that I should have featured in the first instalment because this is possibly the most obvious example, Paul Simon and The Rhythm of the Saints, which is a very highly regarded album. I think it was a very successful album for Paul Simon, but quite honestly back in the day uh, this album, I don't think this album really fulfilled expectations. I'm not sure what the expectation was you know what Paul Simon was expected to do after an album so massive and so influential and so career-defining as Graceland that album had a huge amount of controversy around it regard for that album is not universal when people think of Paul Simon as a solo artist they do think of Graceland more than this album I think this was the Brazilian follow-up came out in 1991 and uh, it's got some wonderful material on it, some of my absolute favourite Paul Simon songs of all time. Further to Fly at the end of side one uh, is a very emotional song for me for a number of reasons. Uh, on side two, the actual title track, Rhythm of the Saints, is incredible. Um, the second track on this album was a big favourite of my dad, Can't Run But. Obviously it's all based around the Brazilian drumming and um, Paul Simon's melodies are still beautifully done and wonderfully sung and um, you know he didn't I don't think he departed too far from the style of vocals and the style of lyric writing that he'd used on Graceland it still has that very um, fake spontaneous kind of sound you know stream of consciousness drawing you into these stories and um, but the backing I suppose you know without the African singers without the you know, that wonderful South African uh, vibe that Graceland had. This album is more percussive, it's maybe a little bit more monochrome, and like I said, it was, I mean, it was, it, you know, it did go down well to an extent, but um, I don't think it was ever going to eclipse Graceland, and I think to this day, if you ask somebody, you know, Graceland or The Rhythm of the Saints, which one defines Paul Simon and uh, his solo career, I think, um, you know, you'd get very few people who would, who would name this album. <clears throat> This one, and um, this is quite a good one too, which I really should have featured in part one. This is The Clash and Give Em Enough Rope. And this falls into the category again. There were quite a few records in the first instalment which were follow-ups to debut albums. And um, you don't really get much more iconic than The Clash's debut album. You know, an absolute milestone in the history of British punk music. Very raw, very direct very political and had a strong reggae influence, bit of a reggae vibe coming through on some of the tracks and clearly a pivotal album. There were so many punk bands who came up in its wake, people who learned to play the guitar essentially by trying to play Mick Jones's riffs on that record. And then the follow-up, Give Em Enough Rope, had a bit of a difficult gestation. They started recording it in London with uh, all four members of the band, and uh, but then a few things happened and they ended up in America. They were working with Sandy Perlman, who was the guy that had produced the Blue Oyster Cult records, and they did some work with him. I think they started in San Francisco, um, but only half of the band were present by then. I think it was just Joe Strummer and, and Mick Jones went out to America, and they found the process to be rather long and convoluted. Sandy Perlman, obviously not really a punk, he was more interested in the guitars than he was in the lyrics and the vocals, and he gave the album more of a polished classic rock kind of sheen to it. Um, th th I think the sessions dragged on and they moved to, I think they moved to the record plant in the end, which was not really a punk studio, it was a studio that had been associated with John Lennon and you know they just sort of, they drifted a little bit away from their influences I think. It's still got some great material on it, I mean it opens with Safe European Home which is what, you know, one of the great Clash songs, Tommy Gunn is on here as well, so it's, you know, it's not as if there's no great material on it but it's definitely more of a classic rock album than a classic punk album. 
the reggae influence has been put to bed really it's not it's not really present it was going to make a re a reappearance on the next album london calling but um i guess you could argue that the clash that it happened twice for the clash because after london calling which was their other big iconic album uh, they then did Combat Rock, which I think was largely seen as, as uh, you know, being a bit overshadowed. But anyway, yeah, not as iconic as the first album, I would say. Staying with the sort of new wave punk era, um, this is one that sprung to mind when I started to draw up lists for part two of the video. Elvis Costello and Punch the Clock. Now this one came off the back of a great run of albums starting with his debut album um, then you know running through this year's model and um, you know all those great records armed forces get happy trust um, and then he did the big album with um, Jeff Emmerich uh, Imperial Bedroom which has this incredible Beatlesy production I would say it's got the Jeff Emmerich touch to it very um, over the top arrangements very widescreen uh, very classic sounding then, I'm not quite sure what happened after that, but Costello decided to team up with uh, the two guys who'd been behind um, Madness, that's uh, Clive Langer and Alan Wynne Stanley, and they were known as the big pop producers of the day. You know, they went on to do Voice of the Beehive, and they had this very patented sound. It was the Clive Langer and Alan Wynne Stanley sound, essentially, and if you went to them as a client, that was the sound that they were going to give you, and Punch the Clock, I think suffered from that really rather than being an album that had its own sound which uh, Imperial Bedroom definitely had this album sounds like another Win Stanley and Clive Langer production with Elvis Costello singing and um, that's not to say there was not some great material on it I mean some of the greatest songs of his career are on here let them all talk every day I write the book you know the opening two tracks on side one just absolutely peerless and then on side two um oh no, sorry at the end of side one you've got shipbuilding which is one of the greatest Costello songs of all time so not without its moments for certain but the pop production arguably doesn't serve Elvis the best uh, you know compared to you know, so the, the Nick Lowe production that had been on his first few albums and like I say, the Jeff Emmerich um, production that had been on Imperial Bedroom, that album is still seen as one of the big iconic Costello albums, this one less so. And staying in the same era, this is uh, quite interesting. There's two, there's two records I want to show for this band and they came hot on the heels of each other. This is XTC and this is Mumma. Now this was the sequel to the big double album English Settlement, which was their first double album, and really it was the one that broke the band as far as they ever did break. I mean, you know, XTC were never a huge chart band, but that album had since his working overtime on it, and it was a big, huge project as well, a massive double album, and it certainly helped them make some inroads. After that, um, the drummer Terry Chambers um, was to leave the band. Actually, he left the band during the sessions for this album, Mummer. And the reason he left the band was that they started to experiment more with um, folky kind of sounds, acoustic sounds. Now, what's interesting is that it's, it's the English Settlement album which has the reputation for being the one that really started XTC on that road. I think part of that slight misconception maybe is the cover because it has a, um, a picture on the front of the Uffington chalk horse and that links back to you know certain themes ancient folklore that kind of thing but really that album I'd say is not so much the start of the folk XTC as bringing the first incarnation of the band to a close you know the loud Terry Chambers led electric version of XTC. There are some folk moments on it, but nothing like as many as on this album. This really is their folk album. You've got um, Love on a Farm Boy's Wages and Lady Bird. You know, just a much more much more natural, acoustic kind of sound. <laughs> Terry Chambers was not impressed and uh, he, you know, he walked out of the band. This album doesn't get anything like the same attention as English Settlement and it also doesn't get the same kudos as Skylarking, which came out a couple of albums later and really plowed the same furrow, arguably, in places anyway. But, um, but with XTC, there was another album after that, again, which fared even less well the big express this was the one where they started to really try and get into some 80s production and um, the production on this album is quite harsh quite unforgiving but again some great tracks from my favorites um or two of my favorite xtc songs of all time are on here you've got um seagull screaming uh which is fantastic really amazing song and this world over as well which is their great um anti-nuclear anti song 
So, I mean, really a great pair of underrated albums sandwiched in between the two big ones. English Settlement and Skylarking are the two that people always talk about. Mumma and Big Express, less so. The last instalment featured Paul McCartney and George Harrison. So then I just thought to myself, why didn't I feature John Lennon? Mind Games obviously came off the back of John's career-defining statement, probably, imagine. I mean, you could argue that Plastic Ono Band was his true career-defining statement because Imagine was the one where he famously stirred in a spoonful of sugar in order to make his message more palatable to the masses. But you can't argue with the fact that Imagine has got the title track on it, which is, uh, you know, the most famous John Lennon track of all time. Also had Jealous Guy on it as well. And um, I think from a commercial point of view and just in terms of Lennon's profile and being a crossover artist, somebody that was not just going to interest the Beatles fans in the room, but a, a, you know, a, you know, a much broader audience I think Imagine was the one. Mind Games came off the back of it. John maybe was not at his best in terms of his own well-being, his own spiritual and uh, emotional and physical well-being but it's still a really good album and it's definitely underrated. Uh, the title track Mind Games is a fantastic song. Tight as Tight Ass, the second track, is a classic. Some wonderful tracks on side two. You've got Out the Blue, I Know, I Know, You Are Here, which is beautiful. And then the great, crunchy, rocking song, um, Meet City, at the end of side two. Definitely underrated, I would say, and uh, stands in the shadow of Imagine, without a doubt. Two more. This one, I was just been listening to this, and it occurred to me, this actually fits the bill. Um, this is Todd, Todd Rundgren. This is his... I want to say fourth album, I think it came out in 1974. It's a double album, and um, I think, is it a double album? Yes, it's a double album. I was streaming it just now, so I wasn't entirely sure. Now with Todd Rundgren, you have these two really big famous albums. You've got Something Anything, which I think was his third album. And that was the one which broke him big as a kind of blue-eyed soul artist with his eye on the mainstream. So that album is really famous. But then after that, he did this really, really intensely psychedelic album called A Wizard of True Star. And to this day, when people talk about, you know, great psych albums, psychedelic albums, that's the one they talk about. And if they talk about Todd Rundgren's more kind of far out stuff, that's the one that people mention. But this album, this album has got some pretty mad stuff on it as well. Uh, in some ways, it sounds even more fried. Was it a true star? I think memory is telling me that it's largely song based, even though the songs are incredibly indigestible, you know, psychedelic diatribes. This album is scattered through with all these really strange instrumental tracks. And it sounds like Todd Rundgren is just basically, you know, lost at the mixing desk, high on psychedelics. And he's he's trying to chart the inside of his own mind, really, the like, little architectural maps of the psychedelic experience. Absolutely full on bonkers. There's a track on the second album, on the second record, In and Out the Chakras We Go, formerly Shaft Goes to Outer Space. I mean, that will fry your brain if you listen to that at top volume. Um, and even the more sort of straight tracks, you know, the songs. You've got Useless Begging on here, I Think You Know, uh, The Last Ride, uh, Is It Love? They seem to have this fried kind of sound, like he's just basically, he's pumping it out in the studio, but he's really burning the candle at both ends. And I think it's quite an intense album. It's not always great. It doesn't always hit the spot, but um, I think it's definitely, it's you know, it's in the shadow of A Wizard of True Star uh, because um, this album was by no means him rowing back on that. And to finish, just a nice light one to finish up, one of my favourite bands. Let's do Queen, shall we? So this is an example of a record which is purposefully designed to be a sequel. So Queen, A Day at the Races from 1975 with a matching artwork. The previous album had also been named after a famous Marx Brother film, A Night at the Opera. That had the white cover, of course, but it had a matching typography, a matching kind of feel to it, you know, with a goat-filled sleeve. And um, A Night at the Opera had Bohemian Rhapsody on it and it had the Prophet song on it. And I think it was really them reaching the highest point, really, of their progressive tendencies. Those first four albums, you know, Queen, Queen 2, Sheer Heart Attack, building to this huge art rock, prog rock, pop crescendo, which was Bohemian Rhapsody. And Day at the Races really was the beginning of them starting to cross over into the, into the pop audience. It was a much more slick album. 
had more ballads on it. It was a more uniform sound, you know, lots of songs with piano. And I think quite a few Queen fans jumped off at this point because even though the look of the album was quite similar to Night at the Opera, I think in a way it came from quite a different place. Very OTT in places, you've got, you know, got the millionaire's waltz on here. And in some ways, in some ways it was Queen going too far, really, one step too far. <laughs> but uh, after this, they stripped their sound down and did News of the World. So this album, it's kind of, it's, it's, it's caught in between the two phases of their career. But I think of the two, Night at the Opera and Day at the Races, this is the one that stands in the shadows. So there we go, that will definitely do. There are a few more, but uh, I'm not going to, I'm not going to flog the horse. So I uh, hope you enjoyed that pair of videos and I hope to see you soon.